Well, tonight we have Garrett Lesko and Stillwater Flies. Uh, that's right up, not right up my alley, so I'll be <laughs> listening closely. Perfect. Welcome. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, hi everybody. Thanks for having me come come up here and do it. I'm uh, my name is Gary Lasko, um, and I'll be talking about still water flies and how to fish them. So I started this presentation off a little bit differently than other presentations. I think most presentations about any tactic or method usually starts off with the tactic and method instead of the flies. But as a fly tire who ties a lot of flies every year, and I'll have all my I have all my still water stuff up here in my pack. So afterwards, at the end, we'll I'll be more than willing to show you guys boxes and things like that. I'll have pictures of it up here. But um, with that being said, I like the flies. I really like tying flies. I like filling fly boxes. I think it's fun. It's a, it's a whole other part of the whole sport and hobby. Um, it's a lot easier to tie flies on a day after work than it is to try to find a way to a river, especially on a day like today when the sun sets at 315 and it's rainy and windy. So uh, it's, it's something I really enjoy. But the flies are, are a really fun part. So we'll start there and we'll just kind of go through it as, as the presentation goes on. Um, but yeah, just a little bit about me before we get too far into it. I see a lot of familiar faces here. I think most of the people here that I would say is familiar probably saw me at the Northwest Expo. That's every March um, in Albany. Um, again, it'll be happening in 2024 again. I'm going to be there in time. Otherwise, you might have seen some articles that were published that I wrote in the Fly Fishing and Fly Tying Journal. Or you might have heard me on some of the podcasts or seen my websites. So I've been on the Wet Fly Swing and the Fly Fish Insider podcast. And I have my own website called Oregon Fly Tying. And then I've been on social media posting flies and fish and stuff for a while. So a little bit about me. But with getting that out of the way, um, going to the flies. So we'll start at the top and work our way down. So flies typically, when it comes to still waters, you're going to be focused on these kind of either patterns or presentation. So answer in all caps with the exclamation point. I think it's one of the most underrated uh, fly patterns out there for top uh, for surface action for dry flies. I really like ants. I've been on plenty of lakes where ants just blow in. This year, the lake that had the ants was Diamond. We was out there with a buddy. All of a sudden, you know, the wind kind of picked up in the afternoon and then it was just ants. You can't really see ants on the surface. They're not like, like a mayfly or a caddis where they're very active above the surface of the water because they're not really Aqua they're not aquatic insects. They're blowing in off the pine trees, usually in central Oregon. That's where you can see a lot of ants. I've been on Crane Prairie where the same thing happened. It's an ant patch. It's usually the wind blows these big, giant ants off of the pine trees. Then they've been eating all that sap. And they are big, so don't be shy. Throw a size 10, throw a size 8 ant. Don't think it has to be a size 14 or size 16. Beetles, which is just a fancy word for ant. We don't have a ton of beetles here. It's not like New Zealand. But they're basically just big ants because people are afraid to throw really big ants. They, then they feel like a beetle is kind of the gateway to that. Calabatus is the most prominent aquatic insect that you're gonna find on the surface when it comes to still waters. It's a mayfly, it's a swimming mayfly instead of a burrower or a clinger. The damsels, longhorn sedge, anyone who's not familiar with entomology, a sedge is another word for a, a caddis. Sedge is typically used across the pond over in England. You're gonna see a lot of English and European patterns that I'm gonna bring up in here. And then midges, obviously, we all call them coronamids. Midges, coronamids, buzzers, bombers, they're all the synonymous. It's the same bug. And then English-style hoppers and chubby tree nobles. English-style hoppers is a type of pattern. It's not a bug, and it's not really to represent a grasshopper. It's more so to represent something buggy that fish tend to like. They use a lot of knotted pheasant tail, which we don't use a lot here in the States. But if you can get your hands on some, it's a great material to have. It adds a lot of buggy action to a fly that wouldn't normally have that. And they kind of come in either more synthetic looking ones with a lot of foam in them or more of a natural with a lot of deer hair into it. It's kind of like a muddler, but more dry fly focused. And then a chubby Chernobyl, it's kind of a good go-to fly. A lot of guys use it as an indicator um, instead of actually using an indicator as like a dry dropper. I see a lot of chubby Chernobyls kind of thrown in there in the mix. Uh, the next one going down, as, as I said, working from top to bottom, it's going to be nymphs. So what most of us are familiar with out here in North America is going to be stuff like carry specials, which are kind of like a dragonfly or damselfly imitation. AP emergers, kind of like a hair's ear imitation. I do mine with a purple holographic rib. It's just kind of different. But it's, AP stands for all purpose. It's kind of just to represent anything and everything that can be in a lake. 
And general calabatus nymphs, so you'll see a lot of those. So probably the most classic one, I put it down here, something like a Polish pheasant tail or a flashback pheasant tail. That's what most people ties there. Uh, uh, Kate's calabatus, a tur or Kate's turkey, sorry, is kind of another calabatus imitation. There's other flies like that. A Frenchie, just not tied on a jig hook, would also be a great calabatus imitation. Um, and then you, the three patterns I have there, a cruncher, a cormorant, and a dialbach. Um, a cruncher is basically a soft hackle uh, nymph. So if you've had a soft, soft hackle pheasant tail, it's virtually a cruncher. But most of them are going to be very thin, uh, thin bodies either made with quills or thread, or they have something like pheasant tails the body. And then it's going to be kind of a stiffer wet fly hackle. It's not going to be more like partridge, which I would consider a really soft wet fly hackle. It's going to be something like Chinese hen or something like that as, as the collar, the, the hackle on the fly. A cormorant is essentially a winged buzzer or a winged coronamid. Wings on those typically are things like pine squirrel, rabbit, marabou, something like that. It, think of your favorite coronamid and then add a black marabou wing or a white marabou wing. It's kind of funky, but the fly, when the fish are into it, they're really into it. The North American version of that is basically a micro leech. That's what we're working with here is a micro leech. Then a dialbach. That's how you pronounce those two words together. I know it doesn't look like that, but it's, uh, I believe it's Irish for little devil. Um, so the red rib Dialbach has won many competitions over across the pond and has paid for many guide boats over the years. It is one of those flies where I know guys who will fill entire boxes full of a red holographic ribbed or a red wire ribbed or a red ribbed Dialbach. It's essentially like any other nymph you would have, but instead of having a collar, it has a throat. Really simple fly. Over, again, uh, in the European side of things, they use a lot of jungle cock eyes. They'll take the split nails of a jungle cock cape and use them as cheeks on the fly. Kind of a unique pattern, very old school, very cool pattern. I have, uh, it's how I was able to place in a competition at Polina Lake a couple of years ago. It was one of those with a red rib Dialbach. And all black ones, great. They're essentially to be a different representation of a coronamid, a buzzer of that bean. And then scuds are super big in lakes. As I mentioned, I fish Diamond. Diamond Lake has something called the Shrimp Hole. It's famous for its lots and lots of scuds. Scuds are just freshwater shrimp. They're in a crustacean. And then uh, Hare's Ear is another all-purpose nymph. But scuds are a big deal. If, everyone's, if anyone's familiar with big fishing destinations or even still water destinations, if you haven't heard of Jurassic Lake at the bottom of Argentina and Terra del Fuego, the reason why those fish get up into the 15-pound, 20-pound range Rainbows is because they're eating shrimp all day long. It's a huge calorie boom for them. It's a lot of protein, a lot of calories for a very simple thing for them to eat. So they get big and they get mean with that. So uh, don't underestimate a scud of some nature. So the next thing going down the water column is going to be coronamids. So some of these are a lot, of, a lot of these are patterns. They're not representing a specific type. There's no like specific type of coronamids. They're mostly how we would represent them is just with colors or different colors of coronamids. The first two up there. The Frenchy coronamid and the false conejo. Those are both fly fish food patterns. They're very representative coronamids. They don't really represent a specific type. They're more attractor, more general purpose ones. They tie theirs with tungsten beads to get them down really deep. You don't have to on those. A chromie is a Phil Rally pattern, and then a gray boy and a flexi floss buzzer. Those are all those two patterns right here. Those are going to be your. Um, uh, European style patterns. It's based, basically a gray boy is their version of a chrome, even instead of silver and red, it's more black and gray and red. Um, great pattern, great searching pattern when you don't know what coronamid they're eating or where they're, how many or what size. It's a great searching pattern. Anti static bag, also known as a window tint coronamid. It's just a, instead of being super chrome and shiny, it's more like a shiny gray. It's kind of a cool material. Again, we'll have some, uh, uh, you guys can see my boxes at the end here. Quills are just a quilled body one. It's just a very natural, very thin bodied fly. Shipman's buzzers, those are kind of, they're a cool pattern, mostly dubbing in either CDC foam or polypropylene yarn as the gills and the tail of the fly. It's kind of a cool pattern. I'll have some in the box here. And then zucchinis, midge emergers, blood worms, those are all just general coronamid patterns that I like to have. And then pheasant tail buzzers and flashback buzzers, these are all just different patterns. The ones you can see right there in the middle of that picture, those are going to be the flashback buzzers and the ones to the left-hand side, those are going to be the gray boys with blood worms on the right. So that's just kind of give you an idea of the type. Those are all tied on straight shank hooks or natural bend hooks. I've kind of moved away from having um, 
having my coronaments tied on curved scud style hooks. I've kind of gone to straight shank and natural bend. They tend to present better when I'm presenting the flies. And I'll talk about presentation and why they work better in that, um, in that arena. The next one, I refer to these as all pulling flies. So pulling flies are any flies that you're going to cast out and retrieve. It's just a term I picked up from following guys in New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, England, Germany, places like that. They refer to any fly that you cast and retrieve that's big like a leech or a damsel as a pulling fly. You're pulling it back. You're adding the action to it. So uh, I have a damsel pattern that I like. I tied it at the expo this year called the Slim Damsel. It's very simple, just marabou and squirrel dubbing as a body with a wire rib. It's really, really thin. Um, and I found that thinner flies tend to produce a lot better. It lets me control depth a lot more. We'll get into depth control and stuff like that. The Jim Damsel is basically just the same thing as the Slim, except for it has a CDC collar to it. So add some more shoulders to the bug and to add a little bit more bugginess to the fly. And there's natural damsels. I'm sure everyone has a damsel fly, fish, fly pattern that you really like. If you fish still waters enough, damsels are a big uh, diet for still water fish. Straggle string buggers. Most people know that as a blank saver. Uh, then you can add sparkle to stuff. So you can see here I have some flies with blue beads. Blue is a big deal when it comes to still waters. I like those. The cat's whiskers, yellow dancer, and pink lady are my takes on those patterns. Those are tractor patterns. I would refer to them as kind of, I would call them a blob or a pulling blob, and we'll get into that. Uh, Up Aven has this great material called straggle hackle. It's basically hackle and chenille mixed into one. You can just wrap it onto your hook, and that's it. Marabou that material in a bead or no bead, and it's done. It's a really awesome pattern. The humongous is the European version of the woolly bugger. The way they tie it over there is instead of having a long shank, short tail, they do long tail, short shank of the hook. So what we tend to do here is we don't want the tail too long because we're so worried about short strikes. I have found fishing that pattern, I get far less short strikes than I do with a traditional bugger. But you would think having a tail that's three times the length of the body, that's all you would get. But what happens is, is that marabou is so soft and so easy for the fish to ingest when they come to eat it, they suck the whole thing in. There's nothing, there's no resistance, there's no pull. They can just eat the whole fly in one shot. Where when you have a 3X long size 8, size 10 hook, the fish has to consume a hook and a bead a little bit. It's a little bit harder than just plain old marabou. So I found that I get far less short strikes on that style of fly. Not saying that buggers or seal leeches, anything like that doesn't work. They're highly effective. I fished for a long time in still waters with a Canadian olive semi-seal leech, and I just... I caught as many fish as I thought I wanted to catch. You catch a ton doing it that way. Um, and then the next one is going to be attractors. This box, if you hit it with a UV light, you'll go blind. It's like looking into a welding arc. Um, but part of that, that's the fun of it. So attractors, I have them ranked up here. There's a lot. It's mostly just different colors. But the reason why they're ranked like that, blobs and fabs are going to be my uh, fastest sinking flies. Fab is short for foam arsed blob or foam butted blob. A blob is essentially just this chenille called Fritz. It's super fluorescent. It's all UV. It's incredible stuff. There's lots of different brands that have it. Hairline just came out with their own in-house brand, brand called Jelly Blob Fritz. Um, Uphaven has it. Uh, Flybox has it. I'm trying to think. Um, FNF, Frozen North Fly Fishing, has their own brand. It comes in a million colors. I tend to like the tequila, starburst, and sunburst color. Tequila is just what it sounds like. It's yellow and orange. Starburst is going to be similar to that. It's just a different kind of shape to it. It's more, just, I don't know, orange vest colored than maybe sunny D colored. Again, it's you don't need all these colors. I'm just a crazy person who ties a lot of flies, so I have them all. And then what I really like is the Starburst, which is essentially light yellow in the back and light pink in the front, kind of like a Starburst candy. That's kind of how the name kind of comes in. We have different colors. I say ginger ale. I got the two different Mountain Dew colors there, so a purple and blue and a red and red kind of color, a black pink, and then one called box wine, which is a claret and black color, which that color has been very successful for me. I do the same thing. So a blob is a fab without foam in the butt, and a fab is just a blob with foam in the butt. So they sink at different rates. So a blob is going to sink quicker, not very quick, but quicker than a fab. And a booby is going to sink the slowest. A booby gets its name because of its big, giant foam eyes on the front. So it's not very, I don't know, polite, but over in England, they have, different, they have a different culture than we do. They're a little less worried about stuff like that. But that fly sinks very, very slowly. Has more has less foam compressed, um, so that fly will sink a lot slower and allows you to fish 
a very specific method, which I'll get into here and in coming up. But chewing gum worms, essentially it's a comp legal, um, uh, like San Juan worm or squirmy wormy. It's essentially instead of using that uh, basically silicone worm material, it's using a chenille that has rubber mixed into the chenille. It's kind of a cool material. Afterwards, you guys can come up and look and feel it. It's kind of a cool thing, but it's I've done very well. I don't know if you guys fish Big Creek Reservoir at all over in Newport, but I've, that was a day saver for me. Same thing with Junction City Pond just outside of Junction City. That red one has just done very well for me when I need to catch a fish because I haven't caught one all day. But you can tie them in any colors. A black one's a great imitation of a leech. It's awesome under an indicator. Um, where you need a leech that really moves kind of look. Daphnia is a uh, Daphnia uh, imitation is essentially what all these blobs and boobies and fabs are representing. Da that's how people make it okay. Because if you tell people I'm just fishing something that looks like an egg and people get a little weird about it. But if you say it's an aquatic insect, people get a lot, they, they're much more easy to palate that. But Daphnia is a microorganism. It's essentially a, a, a plankton that lives in freshwater lakes. And they can be as small as a millimeter across and as big as five millimeters across. They just range in different sizes. But what happens is they tend to cluster in balls um, in pelagic areas of still waters. Pelagic is the open area, the areas that could be over 40 feet or 200 feet. It's just these open areas of a lake. So places like Detroit would have a lot of pelagic areas. It's a deep reservoir with not a lot of... Um, littoral zones. Littoral zones is anywhere where the sunlight hits the bottom of the lake, which causes the weed growth, which brings in bugs, which brings in fish. So you have pelagic and littoral zones of, of the lake. So what happens is these clusters of Daphnia sit at specific depths in the water, either eating sunlight or eating microorganisms as they move along. And when they're in that cluster, the fish will move through them just like whale eating krill. And so what happens is, is if you can match that color of that Daphnia and you can put it in front of the fish, they'll eat it without hesitation. You'll get these really, instead of getting a very sharp takes, you'll get these very long kind of draws and eats. It's, it's a very kind of cool way to fish. And it, there's no other way to represent something that's a millimeter, a square millimeter size thing. Because they cluster, that's the only way we're able to represent them. And so um, I use melon. Melon's a really great color over in Central Oregon, but most people are going to use like a pink or a flesh color. Apps worms, essentially this is another type of worm material. It's kind of, some people call it a blood worm, but an apps worm is also known as a brandling worm. Again, it's a very English pattern, but it uses flexi floss for the antenna and the tails and the, and the rubber legs on it. So it can have anywhere between four to eight legs on it. I tie mine with D-rib as the body. I'll show those off. It's what got me a great tiger trout this year at um, Diamond Lake. So it's one of those underrated material, uh, underrated flies. We don't fish it at all over here, generally speaking. You're not going to see it at any fly shop you walk into. But red's the most common color, and then amber and olive and purple kind of go down in subsequent priority. Then a, bi a bionic worm, that's a Phil Rowley pattern. It's basically an orange bead, red body. Uh, fluorescent pink tail. I tied that version and I also tied it in black. Excuse me, black is again to make it look more like a leech. So how to fish them? The first method would be naked. Naked is not as fun as you think it is, um, but it's a great way to fish. So the way you're going to fish the naked or with a midge tip kind of line is going to be with a floating setup or a sink tip. A midge tip is just a fancy word for a sink tip fly line. They tend to be not as long as traditional sink tips. If you go buy a sink tip to go fish, let's say for brown trout on a river and you're throwing it out of a drift boat, that sink tip's gonna be 24 feet long, 30 feet long, it's gonna be very long. A midge tip will be anywhere between three to 12 feet long. And they'll have much uh, more gradual sink rates. Max, it's gonna sink an inch and a half, two inches per second. And at minimum, it's gonna be half an inch per second. This kind of method is a way to fish coronamids mostly, but you can fish dries, emergers, nymphs, buzzers, everything I show pulling down there, basically any pattern you want, but it's mostly designed for fishing nymphs and uh, coronamids. I fish this on South Twin a lot. It's what sold me on this kind of method. It's fantastic. It allows you to fish both vertically, so you can fish from top to bottom, and both horizontally, because you're going to be pulling that towards you or you're going to be blowing into it, depending on your method of fishing. So. This kind of method I really like a lot. Um, it's essentially what they do a lot over uh, in British Columbia because they can only have one fly in their setup instead of three like we have in Oregon. They will have one big heavy fly 15 feet down at the end of their 
their leader. They'll cast that whole thing out with the wind and, and pull it back so slowly you can still see the coils in their line. And if those coils do anything weird, they'll set the hook on it. So that's kind of their method of fishing in British Columbia. Phil Rowley does it a lot. He really likes it. If you ever heard, listen to any of his interviews or read any of his books he's written, he really talks about that a lot. Um, the washing line, this is one of my favorite ways to fish and hardly anyone here in North America does it. So the why, why it's called washing line, I'll kind of step over here and point everything out. But what you start off is with a fly line. Sometimes you can have a sink tip. I prefer mine on a sink tip, so like a midge tip or an emerger tip, just depends on the brand of fly line that it's calling it. Um, and what happens is you put a heavy fly or a beaded, either a tungsten, brass beaded or no beaded fly, but a fly that's designed to sink and a fly that's designed to sink. And then at your point, you're gonna do a buoyant fly. That buoyant fly is important because they call it washing line, what we call a clothesline. Your flies present in this arc shape is that is what you're trying to do. It allows you to fish anywhere between one to five feet down but I found that it's really awesome with coronamids because mostly when you're trying to fish coronamids, if you want to fish them at five feet down or three feet down, it is very challenging to do that with an indicator because as soon as you cast that whole setup with an indicator, your indicator goes plop and every fish within 10 feet of that indicator goes becomes a fish in 30 feet away from that indicator very quickly. And so what you have to do is you have to cast and then you have to wait for the fish to realize it's not a bird, it's not you, or at least they don't think it's you, and then they will come back. Um, this method allows you to cast very gracefully. Everything lands very softly. And then allows you to fish that method, not just in that one zone, but all the way either back to you or as you move into it either way. Um, if I go to a new body of water, I do this method with a, a fast intermediate line. It sinks at two inches per second. And I'll put a, I'll put a fab, I'll put a DL block, a cruncher, an AP emerger, and then I'll do like a, a damsel. And I'll kind of fish that around wherever I think there might be fish. And that method has done really well for me to just search and find things on a new body of water or a body of water I haven't been to yet that season. I don't know where the fish are hanging out yet. But this method is awesome. I, if you don't have a midge tip line and you fish still water, it's one of my top producing lines. I really, really like it. And I think it's definitely worth it to have. Um, suspended, this is what we're mostly used to. It's going to be, it's going to be fishing a floating line with an indicator with below it a specific depth is gonna usually lead to a swivel, then some tippet and either droppers or a single fly, depending on how you, how you fish it. People are really happy with this. This is a great method to fish from anchoring. It's a great method when fish are very locked to depth. Crane Prairie is famous for fishing underneath an indicator because they have the channels and late in the season when the water's warm, the channels are cold, the fish basically become channel locked and they won't move out of a specific depth because they can't go into warmer water. It doesn't have enough oxygen in it. So if you're fishing for fish that's at a very specific depth, an indicator is fantastic. And so I don't do it as much as I should because I do a lot of fly fishing competitions and indicators are not allowed in fly fishing competitions. So you have to find other ways to do it. This method, uh, I say that, but I was at Three Creeks this, uh, this year, uh, right after the road opened, I think the day after they finished working on that road. And I had a lights out fishing day. I think I caught 50, 60 fish using an indicator. Everything was on blood worms at a very specific depth. As long as I got my, I cast into the right depth where the fish were sitting on the on a drop off. As soon as my flies got to depth, indicator went down on every single cast for hours. It was unbelievable. So having a day like that is great. And the only way to, I could have done that fishing washing line or fishing naked, um, but the issue with those kind of methods is those methods will always continually sink. You can never stop them from sinking. Every fly you've ever tied ever in your entire life will sink. It's just a matter of how soon it will sink versus how long or how quickly it will sink. So with an indicator set up like this, your flies do will hold to that depth where if I fished a washing line or, or a naked method, eventually they were all going to be in the silt. And if, I don't, if I'm not working those flies, then those flies are eventually just going to be in the mud and fish don't live in the mud. So when you run into something like this, this can be really, really effective. You can still catch fish on other methods, but when they're locked, there's lakes that are really big indicator lakes. As I said, Crane Prairie is a big one. East Lake, I see guys almost doing backflips out of their float tubes, fishing indicators because they fish very deep there. It's really hard to fish a washing line method 20 feet down. An indicator isn't much easier, but it is easier. So, but... So you can, I have a float tube, that's how, that's my body of water, and any more st if I cram any more things in that float tube, I will sink. So I don't add a fish finder to that, 
mostly you're just going to be using your forceps. You clip them to the, your bottom fly. You let your line sink down. Once it sinks down to, to the bottom, you'll know how deep you're fishing in. You basically pinch down a foot past that, pin your slip indicator in there, and then pull up your forceps, unclip them, and cast. Then your flies will always be a foot off the bottom. I use a bobber stopper to let me know how deep it is. So once I hook a fish, pop my indicator, everything's going, I can reset my indicator to the same depth. And that's why I did a three creek. So I was just able to reset to the same eight, nine, 10 feet, whatever it was. I can't remember off the top of my head. Every single time, instead of having to go, you know, I think, oh, well, I'm six foot tall. This is six feet. And I'm in a float tube just blowing around trying to measure. I can just always just go right back to the pin and get right back to fishing. It makes it a little bit more efficient in having that kind of set up. Um, sinking line. So there's two different types of sinking lines. I'll get into the first one. This is just a traditional sinking line. So this is going to be a type two, type three, five, six, seven, eight. I don't think there's many type nines out there. You, if you can find one, great. But it's usually kind of the range of sinking lines. You might see them called uh, like a IPS, um, IPS three, um, uh, fast three, something like that. Just that only means is how many inches per second that it's sinking. So we heard about Detroit fishing at six inches per second. That's how fast the line is sinking. Um, don't, one thing I like to really push to people is don't think of the line sinking one inch per second faster than the next. You would think, why would I get a type three sinking line when I already have a type two? My faster meter is already a type two. Why would I want a type three? Not that it's only sinking one inch per second more. Think of it as it's sinking 50% faster than your last line. That's how I was able to rationalize why there's so many different sinking lines. Why bother? Um, and also, you'd also think if so, this sinks at three inches per second, why would I not just let it sink twice as long as I would let a six inch per second line sink? And you're right, you could absolutely do that. It's just that when you work that fly, that fly is going to raise up faster in the water column on a type three. You're also going to have to sit there for twice as long. So if you have to sit there and be, you have to wait twice as long, you're going to be catching fewer fish than the guy who doesn't have to wait as long. So that's just something to think about when you do it. And also, as I said, you're thinking of it as percentage increases as you go. So a type five is going to sink 66% faster than a type three. So think of it like that to help you rationalize why someone would want all these different types of lines. I keep, I'll count them here in a minute, but I think I carry 11 fly lines with me in my boat bag. I carry a lot of different lines. They all have their purposes. Some I use more than others. Um, but the other sink line that I really like is the parabolic or sweep line. So the way this works is you have a sinking line, a fast sinking, and a sink. So the way it works is it's a triple density line. So it'll either sink at one and a half, three, one and a half, three, five, three, five, seven, five, something like that. Um, and what you do is you get this, I made it very dramatic on the screen just so you guys can get that illustration of it. But that's essentially how the fly lines sink. So what happens is when you first cast, your flies are gonna be sitting higher in the column. And then as you pull that line back to you, the flies will go down and then come back up. So you can gauge where the fish are in your, without having to use a fish finder or your forceps. Because if you hook a fish very quickly, you know the fish, if you hook fish in the middle of your retrieve, you know they're very low in the water column. And if you hook fish at the very end of the retrieve, either you're drawing them up from the bottom or again, they're high in the water column. So it's kind of a great searching line. My favorite one of, of this is a 353 three line from Scientific Angler. They call it parabolic because that's a parabolic arc. You can really exaggerate this by making your point fly buoyant. So one fly I really like is that boxed wine color, the claret and black, um, as, as a booby as my point fly, and then having two leeches or two damsels on as my as my dropper patterns. And so I typically always fish three flies. So that's just kind of how I do my setup there. But um, it's a great searching pattern. I had a guy at a competition, he won the competition at Palina Lake when we were there because he had the Rio's version of it. They call it a clean sweep. And that line sank at, the tip sank at inch and a half, the belly sinks at four, the running line sinks at two. So it's a little bit different kind of sink rate, but he was able to cast basically over the top of a drop off and pulls flies down the drop off and then up to the boat, which is incredibly effective. There's not really any other way to do that in fly fishing without one of these lines. So if you're looking for a cool new line to practice with and play with, this is a great line. If you try to troll with it, it strains out really fast. It's really good for a stationary method 
or a, um, a drogue style method, which we'll get into that as well. So this is how you would approach fishing. Um, and I'll kind of break down the different methods that work with each approach. So what we're mostly probably used to is the wiggle and kick method or the trolling method, the wind drifting method. So you're going to be um, going with the wind either by kicking it or you're going to be rowing or you're going to be motoring or something. You're going to be moving with the wind, casting against it, and just kicking backwards. Typically, that's how it goes. You don't have to go with the wind when you're trolling. You can go any which direction. It just happens when you're kicking, it's easier to go with the wind. It's then going against it. Um, I've been in lakes where I have waves crashing over the back of my float tube, and I'm not moving anywhere, and I'm kicking as hard as I can. Um, so I'm not really trolling at all in that situation. But uh, wind drifting is another way people refer to trolling. Um, you see it a lot done at places like East Lake or Polina. They'll set up and wind drift over humps. Just let the boat go. They'll cast behind the bone as they drift through. They'll use a very heavy sinking line and try to catch fish really deep. It's a super easy method. It's very fr uh, user friendly, especially if you're a new fly fisherman or, or, or not a great caster, because you don't really need to crack, cast. As I said, it's a wiggle and kick method. You can literally just throw your flies off the end of your float tube, wiggle and shake your rod until you get enough line out and just start kicking away from it. And that's, that's a way to do it. When I first tried still waters, because I was so overwhelmed with what a still water can be and where fish could be, I looked at a still water and basically said, I'm just looking at a, basically the surface of a table. How am I supposed to know where fish are? I just kind of did this trolling method. It's, it works. It's very effective. Um, I had a little animation here. So that's where you're going. You're going away. Your cast is behind your boat. Um, the other method, the method I think we do mostly here in North America is anchored. I have a buddy who fishes crane a lot. He fishes diamond a lot. He is an anchor guy. He loves to spot hop. He will move his boat to a spot, park up, drop the anchors, throw flies where he thinks. If nothing happens in 15, 20 minutes, pulls anchor, goes again. and just kind of rinse and repeat. But the main idea is you set up your boat or your craft perpendicular to the wind, and then you cast with the wind. So if it's you and me in the boat, you're in the port and I'm in the starboard and we're casting with the wind. And essentially we just wait there until the wind kind of pulls our whole setup and then it'll slowly raise our flies and then we'll pull them up, recast and kind of rinse and repeat that method. Very, very effective, great with an indicator. So I mentioned back here, um, what we're doing with this method is, um, this is gonna be great for sinking lines uh, mostly. So intermediates, hovers, fast sinking lines, type three, five, sevens, those kind of lines, sixes. That's what this method is really good for. This method here is gonna be mostly good for things like indicators, dry flies, dry dropper, things like that. Um, you can still cast and retrieve with this, but it's, um, but you're gonna have to wait around and let your flies sink when you cast. So just know you can't just cast and retrieve because you're not letting them sink. That's one of the big, I think cardinal sins of still water anglers, they don't cast and retrieve. Uh, they cast and retrieve uh, too quickly. They don't let things sink to the right depth. So um, the other method is lock style with a drogue. Um, a drogue is a fancy word for underwater parachute. Here in North America, we call them sea anchors. And most of the time they're conical shape. So they're cone shape and they're used to either stabilize a boat out in the ocean or stabilize it in the drift. It, it allows the boat not to twist because it has, adds drag. Um, this is how most people fish anywhere else besides North America. Um, most of their boats don't even have drogues. They just use really, really heavy wooden boats that sit super low in the water. So they act as their own built-in parachute, essentially. But all it is is a square piece of material. It's usually a 25 square foot piece. It's anchored, uh, it's tagged to the port and starboard of the boat, and it's thrown out behind the boat. So you're going with the wind. So essentially it just slows you down. So if the wind's blowing 10 miles an hour, you might be only cooking at two with this. So you're casting with the wind and then you are retrieving the flies as you approach them. So the big difference is instead of going like trolling where you go over the fish and then the fish will hopefully not get scared by you going over the top of them, they'll eat your fly or they're coming from the side outside your range and intercepting your fly kind of like a pincer maneuver. Drogue fishing is you're casting into the wind and approaching your cast. So every fish you hook has never seen your boat yet. So your float tube, your pontoon, your drift boat, your flat bottom boat, whatever you're using, they haven't seen that yet. So it's really good for approaching fish in shallow water. When I fished Polina Lake, it allowed me to cover a ton of water with my uh, boat partner. We essentially drifted in, 
drifted in 45 degrees out. We're able to cover the entire east bank of a lake in three hours. You can't do that trolling. You can't do that anchored. It's a very good way to cover a ton of water. The downsides I find with it is it's more equipment. You got to carry more stuff with you when you go. The other issue is, is if you're fishing around people who are anchored, you become the bad guy very quickly because now you're moving in and out and around them and they don't like that. So you kind of have to kind of pick your zones, but lakes around here in Oregon aren't super crowded. Generally speaking, I don't want to jinx anything for anybody, but generally speaking, they're not super crowded. They're also uh, tend to be okay being able to move in and out with a drogue. The only time I had an issue is I was drifting towards the shore and I had a pontoon boat just go right over the top of my cast as I went through there, which is some recreators, but that's usually the worst it gets. Um, I really like this method. It's super, super effective. It's great for all the methods that I've listed before, because if you fish an indicator, you catch your indicator, you approach it, and by the time you get close enough to it, you're pulling up slack as you get closer and closer to the plot, either by stripping or hand twist, then you can just pick it up and recast. And then if you do find fish, stop drifting. Just anchor up, hook your fish, cast again, hook your fish. That's how I was able to find the right depth when I was fishing at three creeks. I didn't just guess and hope that 10 feet was the right depth. I just started drifting in closer and closer to the shore. And eventually when I got to the right depth and fish started coming, I just stopped drifting that far in. Um, it's also great for retrieving flies, but if you're retrieving flies with like a sinking line, you're gonna have to strip and pull faster than you normally do. Because remember, you're approaching everything. So you're building slack. So you have to overcome the slack with your retrieve. So when you see people fishing this method, you'll see guys like Devin Olson or Lance Egan or the Fly Fish Food Boys fishing like this. They're stripping their lines a lot faster than you think. You're like, well, God, they're ripping those flies back. They may be doing that, but they're also probably not moving the flies as much as you think. When I fished South Twin, I kind of came a believer in the midge tip line. This is what I was doing. You cast out your line, and as you approach it, you're just pulling up enough slack where you can still see the coils in your line. So you're just kind of slowly pulling it, and your flies are mostly stationary. And then every once in a while, you might give it a one quick strip, and it kind of pops everything up, and then it kind of moves it. That's how I caught the tiger at Diamond. Everything was sinking. We're drifting into it. I popped it once, let it start to fall, and all of a sudden my line went just straight, and then I was on. So caught two fish like that, but it's a great method. Um, so I really like it. You don't. You can really do it in a synthetic way with either a trolling motor or with your feet if you're in a pontoon boat or a float tube. But when you're in a flat bottom boat or you, if you rent a boat in any of these lakes, a drogue really helps being able to do that. Um, so it's a really cool method if you guys ever have a chance to look at anything online or YouTube and watch guys do it. The guys who really have this down, guys like Lindsey Simpson over in England or uh, Reese fly fishing, he's out of Wales. These guys who do it are really good at it and they catch a ton of fish doing it. So it's one of those things to look into if you guys still water fish at all. So that, whoop, that's kind of the direction we're going with it. I kind of add a little bit in there to have some fun with it, but um, the lines. So I kind of broke down some of the lines, but I kind of want to break down brands and what they're named because that's one of the things people say floating line, but what floating line? So general dry fly line, if you're not going to be fishing anything with a lot of junk and you're just throwing a single fly, those are the lines I like. Rio Gold, the SA Trout, the Airflow Universal Taper. All these lines matter which rod you use, and I'll get into that, but those lines are mostly going to be good for a moderate to fast rod. Uh, where you, When you get into the nymph indicator lines, those lines are going to perform a lot better on a fast action rod, a typical still water rod. But the Rio indicator, the SA Anadro, the SA indicator, the SA indicator is just the old name for the Anadro, but I really like my indicator line. It's textured, but so if you can find it, great. If you can't, go with the Anadro. And then the Airflow has an indicator line. If you're not any one of these brands and you like if you don't like Scientific Angler and you like, I know Cortland, I don't put any Cortland lines on here, just find the Cortland version. They all have their own version. There's no brand dependency on it. This, fly, this fish was the only fish I caught one day when I was fishing in South Twin, and that is one of those pulling blobs in there. And I'll kind of show it up here. I'll put it on the camera at the end too uh, for those at home can see it. So sink tips. What I really like is I like the midge tips and the merger tips. So SA has the emerger tip, that's the line I use, but I'm looking at about getting some of the airflow sink tips. Some midge tips, if you like Rio lines, they're great. They have a short and a long, so I believe a six foot and a, sorry, a three foot and a 12 foot version in both a fast sink and a slow sink, so they have a nice variety. Um, but the airflow sink tips, airflow lines have kind of become my favorite still water lines. They do still water lines really well. Um, my two favorite brands are Scientific Angler and Airflow, personally, but 
Everyone has their own preferences. The buzzer tip, that line is very specific. It's for fishing deep without an indicator, but fishing coronamids. So what the tip is, it's a full floating line that's very high floating. And the last anywhere between eight to six inches of the line sinks usually at seven or eight inches per second. So it's this very short tip that digs into the, the surface of the water aggressively. You usually put very heavy flies on this setup and allows you to fish basically vertically up and down without an indicator. It's a line that came from the, from the um, competition world, but the Airflow uh, Anchor one is the one I have. I've used it very sparingly, but when I have, it's been very effective. It's great for deep water fishing. So the shoals, um, places that are really deep, a lake that would be terrible with that line, Three Creeks, the deepest point I think is 25, 30 feet deep in that lake. It's too shallow for this kind of line to work super well. But FNN, uh, Frozen North Fly Fishing, another English company, they have a few fly lines and they have one called the Buzzer Lockup. Um, exact same concept as the Airflow Anchor Tip. Um, parabolic and sweep lines, so these are the ones I mentioned. SA only has one, it's a 353. Rio has their few, so they have a 1.564, 1.542. And then Airflow has 1.53, 1 1.5, 353, and 575. If you see a line and it says sweep line or parabolic line, five, they're saying that's the fastest sinking point in the line. So it's going to be a 353, three, not a 555 five, five or something like that. So if you see it at all, that's what it's telling you is the fastest sinking point is that belly of the line. Um, Again, these lines are really fun to play around with. They're a great line for fishing drop-offs, like I said, and things like that. So um, this fish I put up there, this, this is not a Photoshop. This is not a weird aspect ratio. That is a fish that's basically a grapefruit with fins. It is a weird fish. It's one of those stalkers that came out of, I think, the Wizard Fall hatchery at Three Creeks. I just love it because it look. I say grapefruit with fins. It's kind of a bluegill disguised as a rainbow trout, um, but it's just a weird-looking fish. So... Um, every once in a while you find them when you fish lakes that are stocked. So, um, and then sinking line. So um, I added some names up here because you'll see them. You'll see something called a hover or a slow intermediate. That sinks an inch and a half per second. It's basically a floating line that doesn't get affected by the wind as much. So most floating lines are going to, what happens is you get wind currents and you can get these bellies in your line. If you want to fish something on the surface, half an inch per second hover line really sinks super slowly. And I, I sometimes really like that. Um, it just depends on the situation, but usually really, really windy days are when the wind is really squirrely. So it's going one direction for five minutes and then it switches and it goes and switches and it goes. A, a hover or a slow intermediate is the way to go. A mid intermediate is going to sink at one inch to one and a half inches per second or one and a quarter usually. It's kind of a super specialty line. It's not one I carry that I carry in my pack and it's not one I probably will get anytime soon. But sometimes you need it just to not sink as quickly. That's going to be fishing the top probably three feet of water. So the hover is probably the top foot of water. Uh, a mid intermediate is going to be the top three feet of water. A fast intermediate, that is my favorite line, period. If I could have one fly line, that is it. I love the airflow fast intermediate. It is my favorite. It is not a clear line. It is not a camo line. It is an opaque blue line, and I love it. It's, it's If I could fish one line, that would be it. And then as you go down, you have three, five, seven, eights, and nines. Very hard to find nines, but they do exist. I don't know many people who use a type nine, excuse me, um, but most people are going to be in that three, five, seven range. That's where I sit. I don't have a seven yet, but that's the next, that's the next sinking line that's on the list to get. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the, that's kind of the sinking line. So if you see something that says fast and intermediate, don't freak out. Now, you know, it sinks at two inches per second. Um, again, the top probably five feet of the water column is where you're going to do most of your fishing. It depends on what flies you fish, but usually about top five. Um, that's a brook trout I caught uh, on Three Creeks, and those are those two leeches that came out of it in a throat sample. They're about three inches long. Both of them came out of that fish. So I bet we wouldn't have as many people swimming up there if they knew what kind of leeches were in there. Um, there's leeches in every lake. I always thought leeches in quicksand were going to be my biggest problems, like people joke about growing up. Because you see Bridge Over the River Kwai when you're 13, you think, oh, it's over. I can't get a leech on me. Um, but again, leeches mostly in North America are not attaching them to humans. They're mostly attaching to fish and other aquatic uh, things out there. They're not attaching themselves to us. But big black leeches, it makes sense why a rabbit leech or a, a seal leech or a woolly bugger does so well in still waters. Because they're in all of them. Um, Three Creeks was just the lake that I got this great throat sample out of. 
Um, so rods and reels. So I use a 10 foot rod. That is my personal favorite. You can get away with a nine and a half and a nine foot rod if you want. I use nine and a half for a long time. 10 foot rods are great for two reasons. One, you got a lot more leverage. So when you go to set the hook, when you get into the trigonometry of everything, which I'm not going to get into tonight, so don't worry, but it allows you to have a lot more leverage. You can really lift a lot more line and pull a lot more slack. It allows you to set the hook a lot easier. When I talk about guys doing backflips on their float tubes on East Lake, it's because they're using nine foot rods and trying to cast 40 feet away and fishing 20 feet deep. You have to, there's so much stretch in that whole setup from the fact your float tube isn't locked anywhere, or your pontoon boat isn't locked anywhere, to your rod, to your line, to your tippet. Your whole setup has so much stretch. You have to move so much line to get that hook into the fish. So a 10 foot rod just helps in that. It also helps you aerialize your line higher above you. So a 10 foot rod just puts the line higher above you. It means you're not gonna slap the water behind you or the water in front of you. So I prefer a 10 foot rod. Uh, five and seven weights are what most people use over across the pond, as I said, over in Europe. They use seven weights almost exclusively, sometimes eight weights, which is crazy um, because they're not catching fish that require an eight weight. To give you an idea, I use an eight weight when I fish the jetty or I fish for Chinook salmon. They're not catching rainbow trout in bath that are bigger than Chinook salmon in Oregon. So the reason why they're using such heavy rods is not because of the heavy fish. It's so they can cast further than the guy next to them or anyone else. So if I were to fish a bank, um, which is basically on the shore anywhere, I would fish a seven just so I can cast further out to maybe reach more fish. Um, but when I'm in a boat, I use a six weight. So my personal still water, still water rod is the Echo Stillwater. I think for the money, it blows everything else out of the water. Um, I think it retails just shy of $500. It is worth every single penny of that. And if you get lucky and can find one used like I did, you get it for an even more affordable cost. But I would pay full retail for that rod right now, just based on how much I fished. It's an awesome rod. If you have a little bit more of a budget, the Echo Lago, which is Spanish for Lake, is fantastic as well. I really like that rod as well. Again, more of a budget, the Echo Ion is probably the most affordable rod there. Reddington Vice is a great rod as well. The nine foot six, uh, nine and a half foot six weight is a great still water rod. It's just a little bit heavier than, than the uh, Echoes out there. The Sage 8 uh, R8 Core, great, great rod, very expensive. If you have $1,000 to spend on a fly rod, that's a great rod to, to get. And then the Airflow Super Stick too. That's just an Airflow rod. It's really only available in England or if you can find a fly shop that carries it. Um, Vision has one called the Still Maniac, Still Water Maniac. That's also great. Um, but those are the rods you're looking for. You're looking for anywhere from a five to a seven weight, 10 feet long in whatever action you guys prefer. So if there is a rod you like that meets there that's not on the list, that's probably gonna work. Um, you can also get away with your nine foot five weight. So it's not as rod dependent, like I'm sure you, if anyone here Euro nymphs, you can't use a nine foot five weight for Euronymphine. I mean, you can, but you're gonna be kind of, you're gonna be much more encumbered than the guy who uses the 10 and a half foot three weight. So this one, you can kind of go more ways, but the 10 foot six weight is what I would prefer any day of the week. And then reels. Um, you want reels to have affordable spools. As I said, I don't have, I have nine or so fly lines in here. I don't have nine reels in here. I have one, I have two reels and seven more spools. Um, so the lamps and liquid or the lamps and remix is the really affordable way to go for most people, especially right now. They are redoing their remix and their um, liquid. Any day now, they're going to announce that they have their new models that come out that don't work with their old spools. So their spools and reels are on closeout almost every single fly shop I've seen. So they're really affordable to get your hands on. And so, or if you're someone like, that's what I use currently, but I'm going to probably be switching to a cassette style reel. Cassette style reels are kind of a newer thing over here. So you'll be able to buy, maybe for me, my old liquid spools um, when I switch to a cassette. But um, cassette reels are really cool. It, what it does is you have a housing that has a, normally what you have on a reel is you have a reel housing and you have a spool. The way cassette works is you have a housing, a spool retainer, and then a spool. And the spools are really, really, really cheap. And they're usually made of plastic. The reason why is when you have to buy these lines, most fly lines are running right around 80 to 120 bucks nowadays. So if you had to do that and then get, let's say, for example, the Hardy Ultralight Cassette is a $399 reel. So it's not the most expensive reel, but it's not the cheapest by far. But new spools for that are only $30. Typically, if you bought a $400 reel, a new spool would be $200. So they're significantly cheaper. They're usually either 3D printed or they're polycarbonate. 
know, just plastic resin. And the cool thing is, is you can, if you do end up breaking one, you sit on it, you drop it behind the truck, you run it over, something happens, you're not going to cry over it. It's only 30 bucks to replace. The Orvis and Airflow one are even cheaper. So the Orvis Real, I think, is around 150 and new spools for that are $10. So that's it. It's just a $10 spool, which makes it really affordable to like stack up the amount of lines you can carry. They're also significantly lighter. That's the main reason why I'm switching over. Um, probably, I'm hoping uh, this spring is because even though most reels are all made of aluminum, aluminum is still a lot heavier than plastic. So I'm only switching over because if I'm going to have nine lines and I'm going to bring in another three on top of that, so I'm going to have at least 12 lines, I got to cut my weight somewhere in there. It's why I've switched in my uh, river packs. I don't use tacky boxes or silicone fly boxes. I switch to foam. I love how well silicone holds it, but silicone is so heavy compared to foam. So that's kind of the way to go. And to give you an idea, most competitors around the world are going to be carrying around 40 fly lines with them. And so 40 fly lines with the amount of spools would add up cost and weight wise. So that's why they go to the cassette reels. They're kind of a new thing. I think they're really cool. It's easy to change your line. It's just bish, bash, bosh. You pop one out, pop a new one in. Not as fast as the lamps, lamps and liquids and remixes. That's just pressure popping in and popping out. I can showcase that up here too. But those are kind of what I shoot for anything with an affordable spool. So again, if you have a TFO or a Reddington reel or any other reel you like, just go with that or whatever your budget allows. But the cassette reels are kind of those cool new thing that I really, um, that aren't really new or not, aren't really used here in North America. Kind of like semi-automatic reels. Those are kind of making a comeback, which are a whole nother kettle of fish that we're not going to get into tonight. So um, I want to talk about must have flies and lines just so people, if you're just saying, uh, this was a lot, Garrett. This is a lot of information. I just want to sum it up really quickly. These are the flies I would have, um, probably in order. I would want to have a damsel of some nature, some kind of leech material, some kind of leech fly, and then some kind of bugger of some nature. Those are my pulling flies. My coronamids, you got to have black. If I could have one color of coronamid, it would be black. If I could have two, it would be red. If I could have a third, it would be a black and red one. So black and red are kind of the way to go. Ice cream cones are a really easy thing. You can just tie a zebra midge. Zebra midges are coronamids. They're just smaller in rivers than they are in lakes. So just tie it a little bit bigger. Um, a Dialbach is a great nymph, an AP emerger. Those are my two nymphs I would have. And the two uh, attractors I would have would be a blob, a fab, or a booby if I had to pick one or the other. But um, I'd probably go with a booby just because I can cut one of the eyes off or cut two sides half off to make it smaller. You can do the same thing with a, with a fab. That's kind of how that fly got invented. What people would do is they fish blobs all the time. Then I believe the Irish fly fishing team came up with the fab. And what would happen is they'd get back to the docks. And before they would get out of the boats, they would go to the back of the flies and pinch the foam off so that their other competitors wouldn't know that they were using this kind of fly. It's kind of a tricky little method they figured out. But you can do that on the water. If you feel like you're fishing too high up, you can just pinch the foam off. And then now you're fishing a little bit deeper. So it's kind of a cool fly. So either a fab or a booby just because you can customize them. Excuse me. Um, and if I had to pick three lines, I say three lines because all the cassette reels out there, and you can also buy the Lampson's liquids and remixes as a three pack. Everything comes as a three pack. Um, I usually start with the three lines. If I could have the three, it's going to be a floater, a fast intermediate, and a midge tip. That will get that will cover ninety percent of all your fishing, maybe eighty percent, depending on where you like to fish. But anywhere between eighty and ninety percent of your fishing is going to be covered with those three lines. Period. At least here in Oregon, I don't know if you guys fish further away, they might have different lines that apply to your speciality a little bit more. But then if I could slap on four more lines in order, I'd go a type three, type five, a parabolic, and then anything else you want to go with. So, for example, I'm the next lines I think I'm going to get are going to be uh, 12 foot midge tips. So they sink a lot. Uh, they have a longer sinking area, but it allows you just to fish a different kind of arc. Um, I fished Little Lava last fall, and in the middle of the snowstorm, we got snowed out of East Lake. We never even launched the boat, and we went somewhere where we could use a motor. So it was either South Twin, tried South Twin, but you can't have a motor on South Twin. So then we went to Lava, way too windy, so we ended up at Little Lava. And we were the only people probably within 20 miles of that lake because it was just wind was going sideways, snow was going upside down. It was crazy. But the fish we caught, we found a little cove, and I fished them with a the midge tip. And I, that's the only way we were able to catch the fish that we caught was on that setup. We had a fish that destroyed a leech booby on the surface like that. And then everything else was on DL box, which was awesome. But I wouldn't have been able to fish it that effectively if I only had a 
let's say a, a fast intermediate. It would have sank too fast in the shallow cove we were in. So um, as I said, I'm a big fly tire. These are the hooks that I use. These are the size of hooks and hook codes. I never thought I'd be a hook code guy and memorize hook code numbers. But when you start tying enough, you actually start to just, you start seeing the ones and zeros of the matrix and you learn all those hook codes. But the Firehole 633 is probably my favorite um, hook, period. Almost all my pulling flies are on that 633 size 10. All my attractors are on that. All my fabs, blobs, and boobies are all on that hook. It's a great, awesome hook. I buy them by the thousand from overseas. So I buy a lot of them. I tie a lot for myself and for other people. The Fully Mill 5095, that's a curve shank hook. That's like a scud or a check nymph style hook that I like. It's really good for things like coronamids. They sell a heavy wire one that sinks great. You don't even need a very heavy bead on it. It sinks super heavy. I did an article on my blog about density. I put a bead chart and a hook chart on my website and talked about the different densities of things. You'll be shocked when you actually look up the density per cubic centimeter of materials. Tungsten is unbelievably dense. It sinks incredibly fast. It sinks, it's almost twice as heavy as lead and it's almost five times as heavy as brass. So it is really, really heavy. So knowing that can tell you how much weight you need to do for your flies and things like that. So if you're interested in that, that's one way to go. The Fario uh, fly uh, hook is a 301. It's very similar to a fulling mill hook, which I believe is the 5105. It's just half the price and I like it. It's from a fly shop in England called Fario Fly. I buy it online. Uh, fun fact, shipping from anywhere in the United States out of the country is very expensive, but everywhere else in the world, because they're such smaller countries, shipping outside of their country is much cheaper. Um, I got very lucky. I bought a bunch of stuff over from England when the queen died, and turns out the pound drops when that happens. And so I got very lucky when that happened. But time it, watch the, watch the exchange rate and buy stuff over there. I think I paid at most like $10 to ship stuff. It just takes two weeks. So if you're willing to wait and you don't need it today, uh, recommend doing stuff like that. So some of the other fully mill hooks, the they're just different styles and shapes of either curved or straight shank hooks. And then the other one I want to point out is the Firehole 718. That's a natural bend hook. So it's not a curve like a scud. It's not straight like a bugger hook. It's just a curved, a natural bend hook, which is one I like for a lot of my, that blood worm we saw at the very beginning of my chronomid box, that's what that's tied on. And then I use a lot of one eighth is the biggest bead I use. I put the millimeters on there because I've kind of become that guy. And I don't know if you guys tie enough, but millimeters are a lot easier to convert than fractions. So the one eighth, seven sixty fourth, and three thirty seconds, I use mostly brass. 99% of my flies just use brass. Tungsten is used a lot, but tungsten is really expensive. It's really dense, but it's really expensive. So either you have to buy tungsten in bulk, um, which can be done. There's a website called Wholesale Fly, uh, Wholesale Fly Tine. I believe they're out of Pennsylvania. They might have moved their location, but he sells 100 packs of hooks and beads. His hooks are $7 for 100. His tungsten beads are going to a fly shop. They're usually double the price and half the amount of beads that a normal brass pack would be. Um, if I had to pick materials, Marabou, Life Flex, those are really big. Life Flex I use for a lot of my coronamids. Dubbing, contrary to popular belief, uh, Ken already came up and asked me about my deer hair stuff. Most people know me about my deer hair stacking, doing stuff with that. That is not my favorite material. My favorite material by far and away is dubbing. I love dubbing. Um, one of the magic materials out there, I think, is the ice dub from Hairline, the UV shrimp pink ice dub. That dub is phenomenal on flies. And so dubbing is a really great material. I use a lot of it, um, natural and synthetics. I just got some alpaca dubbing from Up Avon. That has been awesome. I love tying with it. I didn't think I would like that material just because natural materials can be a gamble, but the alpaca dubs pretty well for being a kind of a coarse, smooth fiber. Um, small soft tackles, those are hard, those are kind of hard to get. Pheasant rump, you can get that. I did really well at the expo this year. I did uh, got a bunch of that kind of stuff. Fritz is that usually 15 millimeter wide stuff that I mentioned from Flybox, FNM, Up Avon, Hairline. They all have it. You guys will see it. That's what I tied the boobies stuff with. Booby eyes, you can buy them pre-made or you can buy cylinders and cut it. Or I buy blocks of foam. They're about two inches tall and about five by eight big. It's just a block of foam. And then I have these dowels or these cutters that I load into a cordless drill and I just drill out my own eyes with that. So I can buy the cutters for 40 bucks, buy the blocks for five and have 400 booby eyes, or I can buy 400 booby eyes pre-tied and pay quadruple that. So it's up to you. It depends on how many flies you want to tie. 
I have every single color of block there is, and I have. Uh, I make most fly shops embarrassed because of how much stuff I have. I have a lot of stuff, um, but I tie a ton, so that's how I justify it. I don't have a wife, so I kind of get away with it. So, um, tinsel is a big deal. You can tie a lot of cool coronaments with tinsel. The chromie is tied with silver and red tinsel. CDC, if you can get it, it's an awesome material. They finally hairline is stocked up on bulk CDC. Uh, Trout Hunter, which is where I get a lot of CDC, has finally stocked up on their bulk amount. I use a lot. I don't buy them by the little packages. I try to buy them by the gram. So I usually buy anywhere between one to five gram boxes or bags of it. I use a lot of it. And you need a lot of CDC to make something float. People want to use two CDC feathers because they feel like they're very precious. Um, to put an example, uh, Tracy Peterson, uh, if anyone knows who he is, he works at Hairline. He has a couple patterns and he has a CDC dry fly that's like a size 14. He uses eight CDC feathers on it. It's un you have to use a ton to make something float. Uh, Lance, uh, not, yeah, Lance Egan's corn fed caddis, I think uses like six or seven CDC feathers. They tied a salmon fly that I use, uses almost 15 CDC feathers. CDC floats, but you got to use a lot of it. Um, I use mostly CDC on wet flies. It tends to trap a lot of air bubbles with the structure that it's made out of. And then it's also, uh, it, because it's so soft, it moves really well. So it almost moves on its own, kind of like marabou. And then quills. Quills are another thing that's really hard to get right now. They've kind of come back into fashion. We were talking about it a little bit beforehand, before the meeting. Um, but quills are around. I really like them. I use them a lot on my flies. I use a lot of natural ones but I'm moving a lot more towards synthetic. Synthetic quills are great because they are always the same size, they're always the same color, they're always available. So that's kind of where people are moving, that false Conejo uh, coronament that I mentioned at the beginning, that's tied with the synthetic quill. Uh, Fly Fish Food has a great pattern called the two-tone coronamid. that's tied with the synthetic quill. So synthetic quills are kind of cool, there's some that are opaque and then some that are translucent. The translucent ones are cool because you can add different colors underneath it. So you can get a, a green coronamid or a black or a red or a, just a flashy one. So they all range in different types, but they're out there. Feel free to ask me about that. I'll happy to field any questions. And that's the next slide. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. I'm happy to answer them. So he asked if we use a, um, what kind of buoyant fly you'd use on a washing line method. That depends on you and how much buoyancy you want. So an English style hopper is not super buoyant and it's basically just a, think of it like an elk hair caddis kind of buoyancy. Um, it's eventually gonna get pulled under. A booby is gonna get pulled under as well. Other flies are gonna get pulled under. So whatever fly you're gonna use, it will get pulled under eventually. Um, it just depends on how quickly you do it. If you use a traditional dry fly, like let's say a parachute Adams or an elk or caddis or something like that, it's going to get pulled down really quickly. You might get even pulled down by the weight of your midges, not even your line. Or if you use something like a booby or a fab, it's going to stay up a little bit higher. So it's really up to you. Just remember as you're working that fly back towards you, if you're working it all towards you, what's going to happen is if it's not a fly that's able to cut through the water well, so like a parachute Adams would be a great example of this, it's going to twist like crazy. And then when you go to recast, your entire setup is going to furl together and get the worst wind knot you've ever had. If you've ever had a really bad wind knot um, while fishing, typically it's because your line is twisting, either from the casting. Most flies tied track really well in the water. If they're a fly that's supposed to sink, it tracks really well subsurface. But it's when you're casting the air, it just spins through the air like an arrow. So what I do, if you can, is add a swivel to your setup. So have a chunk of 15 pound mono off your fly line, add a swivel, then build your leader after that. That swivel is unbelievably effective. Um, I use it when I fish any streamers for smallmouth or rockfish. When I'm on the jetty, I use a thing called a, an Invisa swivel. It's a swivel made out of fluorocarbon. It's kind of a cool material. It's completely made out of fluorocarbon and it swivels just like anything else. Cool thing is it doesn't corrode, so it never binds up on itself and either gets rusty or old. Uh, the downside is it's made of fluorocarbon, so it's not as tough as a brass swivel or a steel swivel. Um, but if I could, you can buy really, really small swivels that have 50 pound breaking strengths that are itty bitty tiny. And they're a great thing to add in your setup. I wouldn't do it when you're fishing dry flies and you're fishing midges on the Waihee. But if you're fishing anything that's going to be pulled through the water or anything you're okay sinking, use a swivel, 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 swivel. Just because the gear guys use it doesn't mean we can't. Um, so I highly recommend that. So that can help a lot. But when it comes to your dry fly, Whatever you're going to go cast out there will sink. 
and whatever, if it's coming back towards you, just know if it's going to twist, you might have a bad time, unless you have that swivel in there. But that might add some extra weight. Either or, I don't use tippet rings because I don't like fly shops. I mean, I'm kidding. Fly shops love when you use tippet rings because when you break them off, they're gone. You got to buy more of them. When you use triple surgeons, you just got to have more tippet. And tippet's a lot cheaper than tippet rings and the whole thing of it. I don't use a double, use a triple surgeon's knot, but that's my dropper. So my leaders are crazy. If you're not, I, I didn't really get into that, but my leader is uh, five to six, anywhere between three to five feet of level tippet. The whole leader's level tippet. So I'm usually using six pound or eight pound level tippet, and I'm going anywhere from three to five feet, three to five feet, three to five feet. So my or six feet. So they're going to range anywhere between nine and eighteen feet long. Um, remember, most of my method I'm casting that uh, lock style where I'm casting with the wind. So the wind is helping me roll out my cast. If I was trying to cast that setup in the wind with that buoyant fly, I'm going to want to sink right there. I'm not going to want to do that at all. It's not fun. But when you cast with the wind, the wind grabs that buoyant fly and just rolls your whole setup out. So it makes it a lot easier to cast. Um, I use three flies because we can. And in the still water, it's, they don't tangle as much because they're so spread apart. Um, but if you're not competent with that, you're not that good of a caster yet, you haven't got to that level, just do two flies or just do one fly. There's no shame or problem if you use one fly. You just might have to change it more often. When you have three flies on, you're fishing three different presentations at three different depths usually. So you have three different opportunities to catch fish. Two flies, two opportunities, one fly, one opportunity. So it's better than having no flies. So I would start with one and then work your way up there. But I use level tip. I've just I've gotten good with my casting. Um, side note, the thing that improved my casting the most was fishing on the jetty at night. When you're trying to cast when it's like this outside, you can't see your cast, so you have to learn how to feel your cast. And when you're feeling your cast, you're not firing too early and you're not firing too late because you're going to feel the rod load so you can cast forward. You'll feel the rod load so you can load the cast and so on and so forth. So try practicing casting blindfolded or just close your eyes or at night. It depends on what you want to do. But I have found that's just like one of those unintended outcomes from fishing on the jetty was my casting got significantly better because I was just fishing in pitch darkness. and so. Um, it means that you might wish you could duck because you know your, your lead eyes are going to come right to the back of your head. But I got better, and that doesn't happen, and I can cast better on still waters and rivers and so on and so forth. So any other questions you want to share with the group? Yep. You can. Absolutely. That would be, that'd be a great fly to fish there. Remember, the heavier a fly, the deeper you're going to, or the more pronounced that washing line bow will be. It's up to you. So if you have it closer towards your buoyant fly, it's going to be, it's going to be bowed and then less of a buildup. If you have it close to your line, it'll be bowed and then more of a, it'll be more of an arc. Think of it like you're building an arc. If something's heavier, it's going to weigh it down. If something's lighter, it's not going to be as much. So I don't usually fish tungsten beaded flies in that method because I don't want to fish that deep. But if you want to get down to that seven, eight foot depth, tungsten beaded flies like a balanced leech or a tungsten beaded coronamid would do really well. You'll be shocked how quickly a unweighted coronamid that is super thin covered in like a UV resin would sink. That kind of fly sinks super quickly because there's no drag on it. So if anyone's familiar with like uronymph and they talk about drag a lot and lines a lot. So that still applies in still water. So if you have a ton of stuff hanging off so like a balanced leech has a ton of usually it's tied with like semi seal or arizona dubbing kind of material that fly has a lot of drag so it's going to sink a lot slower but once it gets down it's not it's going to be harder to pull up but a balanced leech like on a if you'd had a two fly rig that would be a really good two fly rig kind of thing so you had your midge tip balanced leech booby and you kind of did a six and six kind of range because then you're going to be fishing probably about five feet deep unless you have a sink tip then you might be in that six or seven foot depth, which could be really good wherever you're fishing. A place like Crane Prairie, that'd be a great thing because you're not too deep into the sticks, but you're not so shallow that the fish can't see the fly. That's just a way to do it without an indicator. Yeah. Anyone else? Interject anything? Well, I'm going to hang out too afterwards um, and I'll have my flies up here. So if anyone wants to see the fly boxes, I have some briefcases worth of them and talk about some other stuff, but I'm happy to answer them. So. Thank you.